world, I should tell you that the, the reason uh, or how I was inspired um, to start this whole thing about the history of the world was because I do teach at the University of Guelph and I do lecture at the National Theatre School uh, and I've been very much noticed. You have young people and um, in trying to get them to understand the nature of theater or text itself or history, they couldn't make a correlation between world events and the development of technologies and how art and culture evolved, evolved in tandem. They weren't making those connections. So what happened was, I thought, well, one day I thought, somehow I have to get together some them so that they can bring this all, synthesize all this, and they go, so that, that is living inside of themselves. That they're not apart from it, but they are a part of it and a product of it. So I was wondering how I could do that. So we started off with a three and a half minute intro where I did the history of the world. But I realized that in doing that, that the, the primary question was, when does the history of the world begin? So if we can start from that basic question, then we can move on from there and get a better understanding of what our place is in the world and what, how we develop a world view. So that's my first question to the audience is, when does the history of the world begin? Throw it out there. I mean, I, this is not this is not me just standing here as a lecture. By the way, I always put this is all, another condition for me is I'm always learning something as well. Nothing. Say when? Nothing. Well, there was when currently theoretically it's a big bang, but does history begin with a big bang somewhere in a universe that doesn't have a name? Because there's no bang there. There's just phenomenon happening. That's just phenomenon. We've named the phenomenon. So there is no history of the world. There is a big bang, but when does the history of the world begin? Someone put type of paper. Say what? Someone put type of paper. Okay, now we've got type of paper, but before that, before the type of paper? Oral history. Before the oral history. Closer, now we're getting there. I was going to say that the history begins when we start talking about history because it's constructive. And something happens just before we start talking. Consciousness. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. That's exactly when the history of the world begins. When, when, with the advent, this thing we call consciousness, this thing we call consciousness, then we are actually not in and of the world. Now we are conscious of the world and ourselves apart from the world. So now we start recording something. So now we're trying to push together. Right now we have subject and object. That's what separates us. And then we have something starts to happen. We get this idea of what history might be. And the difference between us and animal thought processes or insect thought processes, I can't go really down into that, but certainly with animal processes, they do have memory within the sort of the immediate factor that I remember from sense, smell, and sensation, who you were, dinner's here, where are they, and so on. What they don't have memory of, they, where mommy and daddy were, with the pups and so on before them, or the generations before them. That's the difference between, because I always get that with people in the different consciousness, that human consciousness has a sense of self and a sense of history. We build history. We're building the history of the world. And the history of the world is different for each and every, but each and every one of us because is the history of the world a subjective or objective experience? Totally subjective. Totally subjective. Now, when I'm talking to university students and they're in their fourth year, they have not actually sat down with that. And since this is uh, a conference about technology, and I was talking to Dr. Ruth Bolton last night, who's a psychoanalyst, we were talking about this because this is a part of the thing that interested me was because there's an interesting thing that happens, this dissociation that's happened with technology. Because it's right there with us, and all of us are supposed to bring us closer to each other in a very mystical way, it's removed us from our own personal experiences. So we're not in touch with this thing we call consciousness so much. In fact, what's happening is we're becoming less and less conscious. But I want to go back to consciousness again, because that's again what was the history of the world. And I just want to touch upon this thing called atavistic memory. Do you know what atavistic memory is? Well, here's the gift that we all have. We all have atavistic memory. It's just now that we've broken the DNA genome and that we can actually go in there, we know that, in fact, we all have implanted within our DNA the history of the world, of our ancestors. 
right down to when we get out of that ooze and think it's all in there somewhere. Hence, we can recognize the archetypes. Yes, okay. Well, that's the thing. Now, here's where we get to the thing of the subjective or objective, right? Because the implanting there is, unless you can pull it up and examine it, it's unconscious. Once you can bring it up, then you're dealing with the subjective, objective question. But it is there. Again, I'm going back to the history of the world. That's why we have the archetypical stories. That's why we have the archetypical hero's journey, or heroine's journey, since we're in a patriarchal society, we forget that it's the heroine as well, right? The same, the, those stories are recognizable in all cultures, thank you, Joseph Campbell, because of that atavistic memory, because that's where the history of the world was beginning. And some parts of it, are so deeply buried within our subconscious that we're startled when we rediscover that because we're not discovering anything new per se. We're actually rediscovering generations to say things over and over again. I really like the technology. It's really interesting thing about technologies and how they alter consciousness to a certain extent. Consciousness tends to the quality of consciousness is an awareness of the other of the object. There's a difference between the con consciousness emotions and sensations. So I want to talk about that. I want to talk about those that as well because that affects our ideas and our relationships to the history of the world. And I always ask my audience members, what comes first, thought or feeling? Feeling. Why do you think feeling? That's the universe. Now here we go. These are the universes that you guys are living in. Why do you why do you think feeling and why do you think thought? Let's go with feeling first. Okay. Feeling? You're with feeling? Now, are you saying are you saying feeling or sensations? Well, sensations are even at a lower level. So what is the difference between sensations cause feelings which, which manifest themselves in thoughts? What are the difference what is the difference between sensations and let's say, let's get so what that's in the feeling place? I'm gonna put sensations there, because it's going to talk emotions, and that's what we're really talking about, right? Emotions and sensations. What are the difference? Is that the guy can't control his emotions. 
So he's going to make a lot of stupid decisions based on his emotions because he can't take them through. But in this play, you have Cordelia. Cordelia, his youngest daughter. Now, are, is everybody here familiar with King Lear? So here's the thing with Cordelia. She knows herself enough to know that she can't say to her father when he asks, if you want the biggest piece of the pie, tell me how much you love me. She says, as a rational person, I can only love you as much as a daughter should, and when I marry, I will love my lord to my lord, but I will still love you as a daughter should, but I won't kiss your ass as much as Reagan is honorable. And he says, get out! Because he can't handle it, and he has no control. And what we see in the journey of Lear is, when he finally gets control, the big storm scene, right? the big storm scene, which is really a symbolic interaction with his subconscious. Shakespeare didn't even have the language of subconscious, but that's what's happening. And that's the transformative. He transforms within that. He battles the winds that, that are blowing, the, that, that are blowing the barricades are the winds of his mind. So what I'm really saying here, is what I'm really pointing out here, hopefully, that we're is that the history of the world, this objective, this subjective relationship that we're having is a creation from, from this, whatever we call this thing called mind. Yes? Okay. You with me on that? I like that. Because I, then I get into this thing called, again, about the objective observer. Is anybody familiar with the term the objective observer? Okay, so what I want to go through with the objective observer while we're here as well, just so we can touch upon it. If a tree falls in the forest and there's no one there, does it make a sound? No. Why not? The sound is made in your ear. That's exactly it. So there has to be someone there to call it sound. Now people struggle with that concept all the time. Because what we're all looking for is certainty. We're so held within this box, this construct of our history and how it works that when someone actually proposes that a, some, a phenomenon is happening up there and there's no one there to hear it, then it, it's still happening. Well, of course there's phenomenon happening up there. We, are ha we, we just name it sound. Well, that's what I mean. It's the way you framed it as sound. Clearly, there's vibrations being pushed through the air, but you've named it in a certain way that, yes, sound is not happening. Sound is not happening. No. Sound is just a wave that's coming towards our auditory. But when the tree falls, it's definitely going to be, it's going to push air, so it's going to cause vibrations. It's a phenomenon. Yeah. I'm just, again, the, the thought process is it's like stepping back inwardly to say, examine this relationship to outward phenomenon. I bring it back three steps. Why did I start to lecture this way? Because my students were in a soup of emotions and concepts and ideas that were locking them in rather than expanding that thing called consciousness. And so I had to find tools and ways to communicate them so they could open up those portals again because one of the biggest challenges was to activate their imaginations because of their relationship with technology. Because of their relationship with technology, because they're all game boys and game girls and whatever, for me to get a, a young actor to pick up a pencil and say, imagine it's a sword, well, that's, that right now, that's one of the hardest things to do. Of course, when we were younger, I think most of us, if we want to go play with these magicians, we go and grab a stick and say, here's the wand. Now the kid needs to have the, the stick, needs to have a Harry Potter like label on it, and I don't know if it's a magic wand unless it has that product brand on it, or it's related to the Harry Potter movie that I saw or that I'm online watching. So all of that, that relationship, as Ms. Goldman said, she's encountering it again and again, is that, that, that what's happening is there's a short stop, that what's happening is there's a dissociation between the reality that's happening up here and our inner relationship with, with ourselves and our relationship to the history of the world because it's narrowing instead of expanding by the relationship with technology. Not that we're like advocating must not have technology, but we're not having a relationship with technology so that we're having a more objective relationship with it. We're submerging ourselves in it. And we're kind of losing ourselves in it. So I'm going to go back to the history of the world again, and we're going to go back to the thought processes 
Um, so now that we've got that, we know where we are. So what is the thing that's driving us and pushing us towards all these objects? Let's ask that question. And this is going to tell you how the history of the world unfolds, so you know what happens. What is it that makes us go for that thing? That thing. That idea. That shimmer of. Sensation seeking animal. <laughs> yeah, we are, but they're, now we're more sophisticated. Now we've actually built things. First of all, we built things. The, the, most, the most adored object in human history is? The iPhone. <laughs> most idolized object in human history is the sun. So we start off with some kind of, there's that outward, we're going to worship it, and that actually helps the human race advance because we want to acknowledge it, we want to worship it, we want to thank it, and that increases our, you know, our, I'm going to say the word, desire to appease it. And so we start to create things for it. We start to create buildings for it. So our relationship to this, de this deity starts to ignite the desire to build things for it. That's the key word here. It's desire. That's, that's the steam engine behind all of us. That's that. Doesn't matter what it is, it's just desire. We're moving towards, and it works like this. I see the object. I move towards the object. I have the object. I grow tired of the object. I see the object. I move towards the object. I have the object. You're going towards that object that I just let go of? Now I want that object again. I'm going to go back to it. <laughs> now that I have it again, we're going to fight over that object. But I want that. Now you're going to go for that object. Now I want that object. Over and over and over and over again. So fast that we fail to recognize it. And that's why I'm, so the reason I'm bringing that up is because this, this is where we get into our relationship and our values and how we value things. It's so transitory, right? One, at one moment, the love of my life is the thing that I can't let go of. Six months later, it's eh. So do we fall in love forever? Do we always desire the object? Or do we continue to discover or create a new value system for the object? This question. Any want to put it out there? Do we have an ultimate? Does the, the object always have the same quality in our mind's eye? Or do we create a different quality or add a quality onto the object repeatedly? So that we can desire it. Yes. Uh, I feel like the objects that we like uh, really stick with, we like assign this subjectivity to. Like your favorite guitar that you've had forever, like it's history and gets name, and uh, maybe you have the more size with like character. So you're saying we're compounding it constantly. It's exactly what we're doing. We're compounding the object with a quality because the object has no quality unless we. That's interesting that you say that, of course. Because you got, you're digging deeper into that world because it's, it continues to fascinate and then it becomes a reciprocal relationship with the object. I just wanted to talk about objects and the object that now we can talk about for, for a moment is the object of love, or the love of my life, and what we think the love of our, you know, the object itself, and how the mind works at that. Again, all related to somehow with the history of the world, because we, governments rise and fall, civilizations come and go, and it's, it's all upon our subjective, objective view of that object, which we call government, deity, king, queen. So, we see the object of our affection, but do we see the entire object or do we project elements or aspects onto that object when we see it? Because it has enough qualities of what we desire that we move towards it. Pardon me? Did you generate an obstruction of it or 
Well, think about it this way. We meet somebody in a bar, we meet somebody online, their profile is intriguing to us, part of the photograph is intriguing to us. Do we see that person in their entirety, or do we see enough of that person that we're willing to, that some, that process happens that we start to fill in the rest of the blanks? We're filling it in, right? Because what I'm holding up here is uh, what? Timmy's, it's a what? What is it? What do you, how do you, what do you, what would you call this? Um, I would call it as a, uh, <laughs> call it as a, uh, a cup of love. It's a cup, right? Yeah. And you recognize it because it has enough cupness. Yeah. Right, that's it. I see that person, the object of my affection, because they have enough of that stuff that I'm looking for, that I've started to already go towards it. And then I start to fill it in. I'm going to start filling in the blanks because as you see me standing here before me, just this whole operating thing can't see all of me. You're seeing part of me and filling in the rest of the picture. In your mind's eye, you're seeing the back of the cup, you see the inside of the cup, you see the coffee. But you know, but for me, it's a little shrine of a Buddha. It's Buddha in a cup. It's not a cup of coffee. Right? It's Buddha in a cup. I think you're talking about attachment. Right? Well, I'm talking about attachment and projection, right? Because that's what the craft of the theater is, and that's what artifice is, and that's what art is. We're pointing towards an idea, and the audience member comes in, and they see Hamlet's castle, the parapet there, and it, it, if it's working properly, they're going to fill in the rest of the narrative, and they're going to see the hallways, and they're going to see Gertrude's chamber. The same thing happens when we fall in love. We see an aspects of that, what we're looking for, from back here, we start projecting the rest on. It's only like six months later or a year later into it that something else starts to happen when we actually start to see them. What are you doing here? Beside me, snoring. You know? But again, it's this, this idea of perception. And I go back to why I started this kind of lecturing was because the relationship that young people, and I'm saying young, 23, 24, they, they were all, again, into this romantic idea of things and believing that love was an absolute and that what they were experiencing were absolutes instead of the fact that they were very malleable things that were happening. So I'd like to go back again to the history of the world, I you know it. Um, so now that we're having an idea of where I'm coming from with the history of the world, because our history of the world is from the Western point of view, which goes back to the ancient Greeks. Right? It goes back to the ancient Greeks, and because I generally uh, you know, teach theater, I always have to take people back to the ancient Greeks and say, like, why are we thinking? Why do we have this worldview? Where does it come from? Well, it comes from the ancient Greeks, and of course, you know, Athenian society, we call it democracy, and it was only around, from, as far as we know in documentation, the Western world, by the way, I also study Eastern philosophy, which goes even a little further back, but from the Western point of view, once they have, have this idea of their own history, then they get theoretical about it, then they get philosophical about it, right? And the philosophy and how they get philosophical about it is through their theater. Kind of very interesting that it was uh, Aristotle that coined the phrase, this thing we call catharsis. So like this thing we call catharsis, and when I ask my theater students about it, like, what is catharsis? What is catharsis, by the way? Feeling strong emotions, but they then surviving them. And then surviving them. And then surviving them. Ah! Survive that. Uh, well, not bad. Not bad. It's pretty close, you know. The thing was, you have, and it's, you know, theater evolves from ritual. And our experience is that when we take, for those of us who still go to art museums or they enjoy a great piece of literature or even a great movie, what we're really going back to is that thing that, that our great great ancestors were experiencing was it was a religious experience, an experience of ritual that removed them from their mundane lives to an elevated place. An elevated place beyond the banal, so that we, they start to go into the realm of the gods. So for the Athenian audience in the amphitheater, when the whole society is sitting there, and they're watching Medea. Medea does not kill her children in front of the audience because in Greek classical Greek tragedies, 
it's all related to gospel days because it's an auditory. They are listening. We're a very visual society. They're listening. But when Medea comes out, she says to Priam, I killed those kids because you cheated on me, and I dashed their heads against the rock, and so on and so forth. The, the disbelief between the audience and the player, and in that case it was a chorus, with one, you know, a chorus, has been, it, it has now evaporated completely. They are not watching the drama. They are in the drama. It is them. Medea is the audience, and that's simpatico. That's what catharsis is, a release of emotion, because you can't hold it in anymore, and it's through a collective expression of emotion. Collective. We are Medea, we have committed infanticide, and through that experience, we walk away from that experience, having shared it collectively, knowing we don't want to do that again. So the cathartic experience, now we relate catharsis to, I had a great emotional thing and I let it all out. Singularly. That discussion was very cathartic for me. Singularly. But catharsis is communal, which takes us back to technology, right? We don't go see movies so much together anymore. We watch them alone. So I can't have that, that shared, and again, this thing we call atomistic memory, the collective unconscious, this catharsis can only truly be experienced, true nature catharsis, as a community. And technology separates us from the community. Now, it was different in the 50s when we go uh, jumping around the history of the world related to technology, because when the Beatles came to North America, some of us might have been around then. There wasn't a kid or an adult on the street. They were, everyone was in front of their TVs communally experiencing the Beatles cathartically screaming in each household, strangely enough. Across the many choices, the technology was there, but it was still the hearth. It still had, a, it still had the ability to bring us all in collectively, because we've all talked about the same things. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not uh, eschewing technology. I'm just examining the relationship that, and the effects that technology has had on us in terms of our relationship to ourselves, to our self community, but more, more so, look how we're looking inwardly towards our relationships, right? So there's catharsis right there. That's catharsis. Whenever we go to a movie or, or, or a play, isn't that really what we want? When we go, the closest thing we get to that is when we go to a concert or to a musical because it's music that takes us up there. Right? It's music that takes us up there. Whereas for the Elizabethan audience, it would be language. Because the English Renaissance is, 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 is the Renaissance is one of language. Whereas the Italian or European one is architecture, visual arts. Interestingly enough. They're happening around the same time. It's very not to say that the Italians were illiterate. But their great, great, great foods were, they were great foods in terms of the visual arts, perspective, right? Architecture. You've got Botticelli. Not only that, we're not only that, we're also bringing back, we're reintroducing. See, I'm jumping around because they only have 40 minutes. We're jumping around because we're bringing back that ancient Greek world that was forgotten and buried through the Dark Ages. We're bringing it back, we're bringing something else back, we're reintroducing paganism. And it's technology that's doing it. It's technology because the technology in the Italian Renaissance is going to be from painting to the introduction of perspective, which is in, 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 so we have a new use of color, a new way of relating to the canvas. Before Giotto, we have Byzantine art, which is all gold background, no dimension, and all of a sudden color becomes the introduction of color and perspective is the new technology. We're bringing you into the canvas. And we're going to change your perceptions and consciousness 
well, me introducing pagan themes. I only bring that because I have to get up to, I, I realize we're bigger are now. Maybe it goes, I just want to go over a little bit. Okay. So, I, because I like that, I always ask people again, uh, you know, uh, when, when we're, when our civilization and cultures have been developing and these introductions of technology, when I jump ahead to the, to the late 19th century into the 20th century and say, why do we get into abstractionism and surrealism? It is a technology that precipitates this. Some new invention happens, and all of a sudden the artists go, I don't want to paint, uh, I don't want to paint that still life and make it look like there's a real bowl of food there anymore. I don't have to anymore because we have a new invention that's called the and once they had photographs, they why do I have to paint you the like I don't have to paint nature anymore. It forces the their own aperture had to open up in a different way. So they start to look, they start, is that, that technology was like a great, sort of, let's say, a, a great, it's like a taser of art. It's like a taser of visual arts. I don't have to paint the natural world anymore. Now I can go inwardly, like Kadinsky, now I'm going inwardly, strangely enough, that technology that brought the outside world and recorded it, got those, the, those artists and the, the modern artists to look inwardly, because what Kandinsky said, his art, his surrealist abstract expression was to create emotions, a emotive, cathartic response from the audience, of the, from the canvas itself was the experience, not a narrative, but an experience of color. So the technology allowed them, or precipitated, that change. Interestingly enough, that's what it did. A black and white photograph of that procedure open the gateways for a whole other expression a form of art. But I'm going to go back to Shakespeare again for a second, because <coughs> we love him. Um, and by the way, not only Shakespeare, but it was the King James Bible. King James Bible uh, that is the uh, that is the pinnacle of the English Renaissance is the King James Bible. He spent a fortune, actually he spent all of his fortune on it, and then he consolidated the whole Bible, the Bishop's Bible, and so on and so forth, and that they, they synthesized it in what we now know as the King James Bible in order to make it very palatable to its audience so that they had a lot of people had problems with it, so that it would sound new and fresh enough, but still sound like the Word of God. Again, I'm going to language because language has a way of transforming. The reason why I'm getting to Shakespeare is because Shakespeare, in the history of the world, changed the way people thought because of how he used language. That's why he's still popular today. And I liken it to Mozart. If you listen to Mozart, you're going to be able to listen to Mozart, right? The, the IQ quota of the, of the child or the listener will go up. Believe it or not, reading Shakespeare does the same thing to your brain. It does the same thing to the connective tissue and starts to transform thought processes because they're more complex thought processes because he's dealing with imagery. And what I found with students who think that they're speaking another language is, when I'm teaching it, I really get them to read it cold at first. And all I get them to do is to, uh, to read it as clearly as possible and focus on text. Don't even think about meaning yet. And just to adhere to the punctuation and breathe. And what eventually starts to happen, much to their surprise, is that they start to think that their thoughts become clearer. And they actually start to focus because this, this apparatus between looking at the text and reading the text, all this starts to work together. And then what happens with the, the Shakespeare text itself, it starts to lead the reader. Once the reader's, the reader's mind processes slow down, right? Once they slow down, then this, they start to have a real relationship with what's on the page. And the, and, and the poetry itself, the text itself, starts to alter the thinking processes. I don't know why it happens, but it happens. And sort of my contention is that's the reason why this is still so popular. And when it's done properly, that's why it still affects an audience. Because we have that thing, that collective unconscious, that collective thing back here happening. Right? So it starts to activate that again. And as I said, I was talking to uh, Dr. Goldman last night, and she was saying, oh yeah, that's, of course that works, right? And she said, it might also stimulate serotonin. It's 
So how could that possibly be? Well, she said, because you're getting, you make all those neural, neural connections are now starting to be activated, so there's going to be a chemical reaction, right? So I asked her about, so what, what kind of chemical reaction is happening when we're hooked to the screen, right? And, hooked to the, and she said, well, it's an interesting thing that does happen. There's high, there's, on a certain level, there's higher brain activity, but it's also what happens is they get the, the, uh, the person who's in the game or spending a lot of time uh, at the computer, not so much engaged in problem solving, solving or creation, it's almost like they're becoming hypnotized, so there is lower brain activity. Or it just goes into, because what happens, it's channeled into various modes of, I'm only here to play this game, so I'm not using other parts of the brain. Whereas this is stimulating all sorts of things because it's creating images in the brain. And the images and the ideas are starting to activate emotions. world, right? So he's still having an effect on us. This guy. So um, these technologies like the Gutenberg Bible and the, the printing press, they actually did start to expand and to broaden consciousness. Because all of a sudden you didn't have all these months or years spending all that time trying to create one Bible. They were available to more people, and that collective thing that we're talking about is spreading like wildfire. So, my question, and what I'm not sure of, what I'm still trying to examine is, will we get to a place with our technologies where that kind of sharing, where we'll get back to that kind of sharing, or will we go into more and more isolation? Because we're still in the world, we're still, we're still in terms of our, we're still post this idea of what we call alienation. Because early, earlier societies, they didn't feel the alienation, right? Because they had a collective purpose. And the technologies that were being developed were for the common good, which takes us back to that guy Aristotle, a good life. His idea of a good life was, it's okay that we should own private property, that we collectively should give back to the society, but it's okay for me to be successful on my own. But the good life, was one that we shared in our prosperity collectively. It wasn't a communist. He was actually saying you could be very successful. Whereas Plato, Plato, his argument was, no, we need philosopher kings to tell us what to do. And forget this private property thing, we just put everybody together in collectives, and they'll be ruled. But um, this is where, I, again, my friend Spive can read this book, and I advocate reading this book. It's called uh, The Life of Cain struggle for uh, the Western world and the Aristotle and Plato, the world of the product of that. Um, but going to so the reason why I bring them up, because of how their, this idea what we call philosophy, it's also, you know, that was the uh, domain of intellectuals and academics for such a long time, but with the advent of technology and the printing press, it becomes public domain. And so again, it's technologies bringing it out to the people, and will the people read it, and will they actually activate or become proactive in their relationships to it? Um, so that's where we are now. So this is what I thought. I, I this is what I've been looking at, and I'm just curious: Does anybody have any idea or hypotheses of how where we're going with this technology? Yeah. Well, I was just thinking that on the one hand, you could make an argument that technology is all about making us more isolated. But, because of our sake of, for instance, the oral tradition, so didn't that mean that everything in terms of knowledge, or at least stories and stuff, was about people being together, right? Yeah. So from listening to someone talk, you know, like the native oral tradition, all that kind of thing. And so then as soon as you have books, you have an idea, oh, I don't have to listen to someone tell me a story, I have to see in their book. I can go and read my story, right? And then, but I was thinking, in terms of um, about students and stuff, and I thought on two levels about sort of technology and them, and then sort of groups or individuals. But anyway, one thing I thought of was this the way I would have to say that there's an argument that I don't know whether it's necessarily a positive thing, but that a lot of people do experience technology on a scale level. Like, for instance, when I started to talk about feminism with someone, a young woman in my class, 
they all start talking about Emma Watson. Many of you have maybe heard Emma Watson at the UN. Well, Emma Watson at the UN, if you're a 19-year-old girl and you haven't heard of Emma Watson at the UN, she's apparently a movie star, uh, I was being aware of, I guess she's in a Harry Potter movie. Oh, yes, uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, who talked about feminism at the UN. And every girl in my, a young woman in my class had an idea about feminism that came from Emma Watson, right? And the first thing that educate me. What's interesting to me is that they, and I, I'm not really on the side of it, but it's better than feminism, but that's another story. But it's like, you know, they had to educate me on the notion of, I thought it was interesting that they all were, were there. And they're not friends. I mean, there's students in a class, young women. Mm -hmm. And I think that my theory is that a lot of young women have <laughs> seen Emma Watson and the UN talking about feminism together. Like, even though they're in their own little rooms, they're twittering each other or whatever they're doing, Instagramming each other. So all I'm saying is that there's an interesting kind of, to me, an interesting kind of group. Well, that's, that's the Bible one. experience. It is. That's the Bible experience. It is. And never mind the fact that when something, when something happens and everybody goes to the website, apparently, I don't usually, but they're all going there attacking somebody. You know, if somebody says something, I apparently say, you guys probably know well, obviously, you know more about the web than I do. But, you know, and everybody's there on that website, apparently. Uh, all I'm saying is that the web could be a place for kinds of communal experience. Now, I don't know. No, absolutely. You want to call it not real communal or bad communal or different communal, but I think people are still seeking that in, in the internet. They're not just seeking to be alone in their rooms. I don't know. That's an interesting point. Is there a step behind that? Twitter is a very hybrid thing, like local Twitter. And I don't believe too much about the point of this Twitter. If you follow people that you know anyway, you know, that you running into your yard, different organizations with and so on. And you have to have a particular conversation going on about a variety of things that are really some kind of in between thing. It's not textual, it's not exactly moral, a lot of it, but it's a it's a very interesting thing. I, I, it is to me for sure. Where it's going, you know, certainly like this was just at the beginning of a really big thing here. Well, that's it. I think that's the, I, you know, I, in discussing this, part of the, uh, part of the reason why I do, I think that we should continue the discussion, you know, rather than just like, saying this is an outward thing and that these are trends, that's sort of the catchphrase of the, the trends that are happening, rather than discussing the actual effect that it's having. I'm not saying I'm pro or con. Actually, I really love technology, so I love using it. I'm just very curious about how, how it's affecting people especially when I'm going in an academic setting, why can't these students put their thoughts together? It's a good first person I've heard who has like an app like empirical, like because you see a new crop of students every year, mm -hmm. you can say that this or that change has occurred. You see a whole lot of stuff about like kids don't you know, kids this, kids that, right? Mm -hmm. And you really you just have to discount it because that's based on the projection. But if you're actually seeing something that seems real, you can identify something that's produced by, by the, the way it was using this media, then it's, it's, that's, you just can't have a discussion about that because it's something actually not about it. Well, I also believe to test to see can, what happens when I start to use techniques that bring them to yeah, back in. Thing. Does that affect, can they make those discoveries? And when they make those discoveries, they're quite an exciting one. I can guess. I would say this is like a really good argument, I think, for um, uh, pushing uh, in the internet and networks and the way people engage with them uh, into more sustainable like modalities. Like when the internet started, it was just a way of communication and broadening horizons. And uh, like, I spent my like, teenage years in like a in a suburb like without um, like without like a feeling of community. So right. it's like a fragmented suburban existence. And you know and I was like a really privileged kid, like I didn't have you know had my issues or whatever, but um, finding communities online uh, through like both reward systems and stuff became like a way that you were forced to uh, or you were able to, to create new sense of the community and like find self worth and like learn how to articulate yourself because you get discussions and arguments. And uh, so with Wikipedia back then, so you can just like uh, look up the answer to something as easily as there's that's the whole 
whole lot of testing that out there. Uh, I can only imagine what it would be like for um, uh, for like young gay kids in like the middle of nowhere where there's not a queer culture that they can engage with, and uh, other people who are like marginalized by society. But like the trends that we're having in the internet is the same thing, consolidated into infotainment and passive viewership as opposed to content creation and sharing. Like at the time of Shakespeare, like his actual time, you know, if you wanted to be elevated by his works, you had to be city of the globe or be able to get there. Yes. Whereas now if someone is able to create a create a work of like of that kind of caliber, uh, it can be disseminated and like get to where it needs to be. Like the kids in Canada like, can be that as well as like, the kids in the uh, suburb of Toronto. Uh, or not even the kids, but anybody. Well I think that is the thing about the, the, the thing about the technology is that it it, it makes available all of those connections, it makes available all of this research material that you can just delve into and at a fingertips. It's it's what it's what the relationship that they're having with the technology for the most part is not encouraging them to seek it out though. So they're not utilizing the technology in a way that we so that's again part of the discussion that I have with them. What how are you? Why why aren't you using it in a more proactive way in terms of broadening your knowledge of since the subject matter might be Elizabethan theater, why aren't you using that tool to get there? Uh, I wish I could remember more about it, but there's some recent research that's saying that um, uh, kids or folks that are engaging more with the internet, like newer generations, are like their brains are moving more towards like uh, big indexing catalogs as opposed to the actual absorption of knowledge. Mm -hmm. They call it like skim a really great article and they get some points out of it and then index and that article is there. So when you want to talk about that topic, then you share the article. You don't have to. Uh, yes, of course. And I think that's problematic. Now. And I think the sky's point, which was a good one, is that we share if we share certain information that we get on the internet, and it goes by this, this idea of skimming. Because I then I have something that I can relate to, be it Emma Watson, because I know that is hot. So I'm going to share that. That that does give me a ticket into a, a broader conversation. I'm not sort of taking that away from it. Just saying, I know that they're talking about it, so I want to get in on that. But how is that again expanding, expanding their knowledge, their 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 broader awareness? I just want to make a final thing. I'd like to, you know, in my lectures, I often have to point out that art is a reaction to the times. Right? Art is a reaction to what is happening in the day of the day, and so it's a reaction. To I'm really curious to see what the reaction will be to our times with technology in terms of artistic expression, right? So we have we have surrealism, we have agit prop, we have you know the theater of alienation, we have the theater of cruelty, we have various you know we have we do have the Renaissance, we have expressionism, impressionism. What their reactions to the times and perceptions that individuals had or that society had of their times. I'm really curious to see what artistic expression will emerge from this technology that will be a result of this time. I was just going to say that you know, along with that, there's the endless efforts to eliminate you know, the arts in education. Mm -hmm. right? So where does that play out? Um, I mean, art will survive, the art will survive, but um, that's what it's the best thing. Well, certainly a struggle that we've been through in different, various universities. Yeah. Because again, and what, high schools and other schools. Well, it, it kind of promotes, we know it promotes a little more free thinking as opposed to get yourself into that yeah. that niche, that niche job, as opposed to what the humanities used to be was you're going to spend a certain amount of time trying to find out, right, where you should be, as opposed to I've got to make this decision now that I've just got out of high school and I have to make a decision. So I've got to lock myself, it's very Orwellian, right? Lock myself into that key point, and technology is one of the big ones. Well, that's interesting, though. Uh, I wonder, because they've actually been eliminating technical education, a certain type of hands-on technical education as well, like basically, in a nutshell, woodshop is gone. Mm -hmm. So you're taking away a certain level of technical skill as well, and you're taking away the artistic skill. That's, I wonder what's with that. 
Well, like, again, but don't you think those are first world, those are first world problems, like first world attitudes? Nobody wants to do that job, right? So the the the, the, the idea of the artisan, the idea of the artist, by the way, is, is a relatively recent idea. This idea of the elevated artist, rather than craftsperson or artisan. Well, that's not quite where I've been. I, I, mean, I know I'm exactly what you mean. Good. I'm not devaluing. Actually, I'm saying that's how it's become devalued. Well, I didn't pick woodshop because the, the body art is at. I just said that as an example of the technical skill. It could have been welded, it could have been machine shop. I think it kind of all falls under the idea of art is at, brother. You know, why not? Why not a somebody who has an applied skill that is a necessary skill, which is if you were going to high school in the 50s and you didn't come from an upper middle class or wealthy family, that would that's where you would be sort of directed to go to, uh, to study, actually. Well, no, but I mean, but the thing that it is is that you have engineering graduates who graduate and become engineers, and they can't build anything because they lost that, they lost that skill. Mm -hmm. Just as you, because they haven't been taught as artists, they have no ability to really create, they can only copy. And my question is, why is that happening? Who's benefiting by essentially taking these skills away from well, that I can't answer. No, but no, I, that no, I can't I answer. I'm not asking. I that. mean, I'll have some theories about it. But no, that's I, no, no, it's a rhetorical right. question. Right. Yeah. Right. And I find that very interesting. So, this is where I get to in this in this lecture about the history of the world in terms of its relationship to what I've been experiencing in terms of technology and students and students encountering text and the way they're thinking. And um, that's it for me. I hope that, uh, do you have any questions? Or that's, that's as far as I go today with technology. Well, thanks, Jay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.